university historian Thomas Schwartz entitled Henry Kissinger and American Power, a political biography just published about two weeks ago with Hill and Wang. Joining Tom this afternoon will be a panel consisting of Barbara Keyes, Diane Kuntz, and Jeremy Surrey. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, co-chairing the seminar with Christian Osterman. The seminar is a collaborative venture of the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. Behind the scenes are two people who make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Woodrow Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. And I'd like to thank two institutional supporters, the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest and the George Washington University Department of History, as well as a number of anonymous donors. We invite you to join their ranks. A couple of final things. This inaugural session is our annual William Roger Lewis Lecture, named after the founding director of the National History Center and co-founder of this very seminar over a decade ago. Roger, a leading historian of Great Britain and empire at the University of Texas, Austin, and a former president of the American Historical Association has been a mainstay of this joint project since its inception. And he frequently travels to Washington DC back when we gathered in person to participate at the Wilson Center where he is a global fellow. And that's in addition to his longstanding leadership of the faculty seminar in British studies at UT Austin, which he helped to form over four and a half decades ago, precisely when the subject of today's session, Henry Kissinger was at the height of his power. And just to let you know, today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. When we get to the Q and answer, question and answer section, uh, be sure to use the raise hand function uh, in Zoom and you can get in the queue with your questions. And if you're watching uh, on, on Facebook, uh, uh, you can uh, email us uh, uh, directly uh, and we will attempt to incorporate some of those questions as well. And with that, I will turn the screen over to Christian Osterman who will be moderating today's session. Christian. Thank you so much, Eric. It's good to be uh, with all of you uh, for this um, uh, great panel. It gives me indeed great pleasure and joy to introduce our featured speaker, uh, my dear friend, colleague, and longtime mentor, uh, Professor Thomas Allen Schwartz. Thomas, the distinguished professor of history and professor of political science and European studies at Vanderbilt University. His most recent book, which he researched in part at the Wilson Center. And so this, is, uh, this event is also part of the Wilson Center's um, Books at Wilson series. His most recent book is he researched in part at the Wilson Center and uh, that we will speak about today is, of course, Henry Kissinger and American Power, a political biography. Educated at Columbia, Oxford, and Harvard universities, he's the author of uh, several books, America's Germany, John J. McCloy and the Federal Republic of Germany, Lyndon Johnson in Europe in the shadow of Vietnam, and along with Matthias Schulz, the edited volume, The Strained Alliance, US-European Relations in the 1970s. He has received a number of fellowships uh, from the German Historical Institute. We are several of us, Germany included, were uh, fellows at the Nobel Institute in Oslo, um, and he's received fellowships from the Social Science Research Council and as, and as mentioned on multiple occasions from the Woodrow Wilson Center. He served on the Historical Advisory Committee of the, State, uh, of the Department of State and he was pre uh, he's a past president of the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations. He is currently a member of the History and Public Policy Program Advisory Committee. While teaching at Vanderbilt, he has received the Madison Surratt Teaching Prize and the Alumni Education Award. It gives me great pleasure to give him the floor and I'll be introducing our commentators after Tom makes his remarks. Tom, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Christian. And thank you, I wanna thank the commentators, thank everyone for assembling this. I'm deeply honored, especially to be uh, giving the William Roger Lewis um, lecture uh, Roger and I were on the State Department Committee suffering through uh, a lot of uh, bows and arrows and fortunes there uh, back in uh, uh, about a decade ago. And um, I got to know him well and I feel um, really honored to be able to uh, uh, give a lecture that's in his name. Um, uh, 
this book came about, and some many of you, many of my friends here have heard me give this sort of origin story. This book came about because of a, a Lewis Mazur at Reviews in American History, liked the review I had done, and mentioned a series that Hill and Wayne was doing um, that would use biography to teach history, um, that would pick biographical topics or, or would use a, a representative biography to get at a broader subject of history. Um, they had just published, I think, their first volume. It was on Pocahontas to get at issues regarding Native American history. And they were looking for someone to do something on American foreign relations. Um, he offered me the opportunity to put together a prospectus. Um, these were supposed to be short and concise books. Um, that was the idea. And uh, the uh, topic, and I, I debated and certainly consulted with some people about which biographical figure might serve that purpose in the American context. And I kept coming back to Henry Kissinger, um, a man who's had such a long career at American foreign relations, and even though not born in the United States, whose career in many years sense, senses really does represent something about 20th century American power. Um, when I did get the chance to tell Kissinger that this was the goal of the series, a short and concise book, using him as a representative and a prism through which to look at US foreign relations. I recount in the book that he looked at me and said, but you will leave things out. And I do leave things out. I don't cover everything in the book, but it's not as short and concise as I had hoped. It, it got longer. Um, it, I, it was even longer when I submitted the manuscript that I had to cut some 25%. There were a lot of things that had to be left out. Um, I think Another question that I have heard, and there are two other Kissinger books that have been published this year, and I, you know, why another book on Henry Kissinger? And that is a, a legitimate question. I think to the extent I make a, a, what I think is a scholarly contribution here, and I am trying to write the book both to reach a broader audience, but also to reach scholars. I think it, the central argument is to look at Kissinger in a new way. Uh, most accounts of Kissinger, not all, but most look at him as a foreign policy intellectual whose advocacy of a policy of realpolitik for the United States and realpolitik, a pursuit of a pragmatic or realistic foreign policy that largely disregarded moral or ethical considerations and that was geared largely toward the promotion of American security and interests with interests being defined somewhat narrowly. Um, that's the usual approach to Kissinger. Um, I don't think that's incorrect, but I think it's incomplete. What my book seeks to do is to look at Kissinger as a political actor, even a politician. And this was an insight I got in part from a comment by the French foreign minister, Michel Jobert, who commented that he thought Kissinger was far more of a politician in the way he acted. Um, and I think the, the basis of this is to understand, and this is the way in which it does illuminate, I think, uh, the history of American foreign policy, is to understand that American foreign policy is fundamentally shaped and determined by the struggles and battles of domestic politics. Um, the Germans would call it the primat, the in politik. Um, this is the goal that I, I want to convey, um, even in looking at Henry Kissinger. Um, Kissinger always portrayed himself from the very earliest, and, and some of you may have seen the 1958 interview he gave to Mike Wallace um, when he was talking about his book, Nuclear Weapons in American Foreign Policy. Even then he portrayed himself as somewhat above politics, independent, uh, not a partisan. Um, the TV news archive at Vanderbilt, which was one of my great sources, and I think does is an original source for studying Kissinger, uh, recorded a lot of the 1972 Republican National, Con National Convention. And at one point during the national convention, uh, Dan Rather comes up to Kissinger, asks him whether a Vietnam peace settlement, remember this is in August 1972, whether a Vietnam peace settlement will help President Nixon's chances in the election. Kissinger looks at him and goes, the president never talks to me about domestic politics. We know from the tapes, this is nonsense. They talked about domestic politics. They understood political import of foreign policy. Um, the tapes combined with, in a sense, the television material and other material gives a real insight um, into how uh, uh, Nixon and Kissinger approached foreign policy. Um, the book is essentially, although there is one chapter that tries to, to, to give an, a, 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 the essentials of, of Kissinger's career and to talk about his connection to political ideas and thoughts before 
he becomes national security advisor. The book is essentially focused on his governmental career lasting from 1969, January of 69 through um, January of 1977. Um, in the second chapter, after a rocky start, which I entitled, You Can't Lose Them All, because Kissinger was aware that things did not go terribly well in the early period of the Nixon presidency. Kissinger helps Nixon, and Nixon, of course, driving this, to organize what they all called the trifecta, namely the opening to China, they taunt with the Soviet Union, the Paris peace agreements with, uh, in Vietnam, ultimately a, a set of foreign policy successes that would lead to be, or help uh, contribute to the landslide electoral victory of Richard Nixon in 1972. Um, there's a wonderful tape um, of a conversation when Nixon calls Kissinger up after Kissinger has given his pieces at hand press conference in October of 1972. And Nixon calls Kissinger up and he says, Henry, I've noticed on the, all three networks, and this is actually one of the fascinating things, the tapes tell us how often they were watching the television news as well. He, he remarks, on all three networks, um, there's some interesting story, Kissinger, because all three networks featured pieces at hand. Kissinger chuckles and says, well, Colson tells me we've wiped McGovern out. And there is this sort of political sensibility um, about their understanding of foreign policy that I think is something that I think is a large part of the first Nixon term. This is not to say there aren't other considerations that will of course certainly come up I'm sure in our discussion, but uh, that certainly is there. Um, the latter part, the next part of the book gets into, you might say the more unhappy period for Nixon, but more, um, successful period for a time for Henry Kissinger. Nixon wanted to keep Kissinger doing the same things in the second term, but Watergate would destroy his political uh, credibility and power. In effect, it reversed their roles. Kissinger suddenly became the indispensable man. And in 1973 and 74, he would be selected. Gallup would, would note he was the most admired American, particularly for his role in, in the Middle East, where he would play a role first in settling the Yom Kippur War, but then also in developing and, and negotiating the first disengagement agreements between Israel and Egypt and Israel and Syria. Um, he would be pursuing in many respects, I argue, his own goals. Um, Richard Nixon had slightly different views, but Henry Kissinger could basically manipulate and avoid what Kissinger or Nixon was talking about then as he negotiated disengagement. And Kissinger would become, after the Syrian agreement, would be on the cover of both Time and Newsweek. Newsweek put him in a Superman outfit uh, to give some sense of how, how uh, extraordinary it seemed. Uh, of course, he would, there, what goes up must come down. Kissinger had a much more difficult next final two years in the Ford administration, uh, dealing with a much more hostile Congress with investigations and then with certain events that didn't go very well. The collapse of South Vietnam in April of 75, um, frustrations in the Middle East, uh, the uh, Soviet involvement in Africa and Angola, uh, questions about detente, frustrations with the SALT II peace treaty. Much of this also led Kissinger in some ways to rethinking and to arguing that foreign policy needed, the, the domestic foreign policy connection needed to be a bit different. And I, I wanna just talk briefly, uh, a quote from him in 1975, when he argued, today we find like most other nations in history, we can neither escape from the world nor dominate it. Today we must conduct diplomacy with subtlety, flexibility, maneuver, and imagination in pursuit of our interests. We must be thoughtful in defining our interests. We must prepare against the worst contingency and not only plan for the best. We must pursue limited objectives and many objectives simultaneously. Um, Kissinger in some ways um, in 1976 was attacked from both the right and the left for his foreign policy, from the right for insufficient anti-communism, the, from the left for insufficient attention to human rights issues and other questions of morality in foreign policy. Um, Kissinger, in a sense, by the end of the time in office is talking about the limits of American power and the limits of what the United States can do and the necessity to recognize that. At the same time, there was always a tension in Kissinger's own makeup. Um, the British ambassador to the United States commented that in his role as Secretary of State, he is actively searching for new initiatives to assert the power of the United States in the world. And Henry Kissinger, for all of his sense of the limits of American power, also sought constantly to assert that power. Um, I have a last chapter, 
um, which talks about Kissinger at retirement. I don't think anyone thought in 1977 that 53 year old Henry Kissinger would not be back in power in some form, but he wasn't. And uh, part of the reason I argue is because of the fear of presidents that he would out overshine uh, or outshine them or in some ways uh, preempt their own authority as he seemed to have done with Gerald Ford. Um, but I think also the interesting thing about that chapter is I can't really use the, in that chapter the types of sources a historian would like to. Um, I had a funny moment when my copy editor said, you know, there's another book in this last chapter. And I felt like saying, oh, well, that may be, but that, that'll be a book someone about 50 years from now will have to write when those papers and materials are available. But Kissinger did become in the 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s, the commentator on American foreign policy on television and other manners. Um, he became almost a, both a symbol and a exerciser of American power. And that's in a sense, um, I think where I wanna close here and leave it open for comments. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, we now have a, uh, we're fortunate to have a very distinguished panel of experts, of scholars, of colleagues, of friends to um, provide some initial comments and some questions for Tom. And we want to set this up really interactively. So um, I've asked uh, our commentators uh, to, be, um, to be short on praise and to be short uh, altogether and really focus on a couple of key, key questions that will draw Tom out uh, some more on, on, on the main arguments um, of the book. And um, we'll start with uh, Professor Barbara Keyes who holds the chair in the US and international history at Durham University in the UK. She received her PhD from Harvard University. She's the author or editor of three books, including Reclaiming American Virtue, the Human Rights Revolution in the 19, of the 1970s, published by Harvard in 2014, and dozens of articles and book chapters, including one entitled Henry Kissinger, The Emotional Statesman, and another one, The Diplomats, Two Minds, Deconstructing a Foreign Policy Myth, both published in uh, Diplomatic History. After finishing a book manuscript on anti-torture campaigns of, since 1945, she is writing a book currently on the relationship between Henry Kissinger and Zhu Enlai. She's also, like Tom, a past president, a more recent president of the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations, and um, we're delighted to have her with her with us. Ara, you have the floor. Thanks for having me. Let me congratulate Tom. Um, that is clearly a major achievement. And it occurred to me last night that for the field of US foreign relations history, writing a book about Henry Kissinger is a bit like climbing Mount Everest. There's a small but sizable number of people who undertake the challenge in part because it is such a challenge and one of the things that makes it such a challenge is that there already is such a large body of scholarship on uh, Kissinger. So I think among the various things that Tom contributes to that literature, I wanna just briefly touch on two things and then pose two questions. So the, the two things that stand out for me about Tom's book are first, it really is quite brief. It may not look very brief, but he manages to cover the next 10 years in about 200 pages. And that brevity is a very hard thing to do well, to condense such a complicated and event-filled period when there's so much going on in so many different parts of the world. And to do it without oversimplifying and, and losing nuance is, is a really terrific achievement. The second thing that I think is really useful about Tom's book is that last chapter that he mentioned on Kissinger after 1977. And Tom covers that quite ex extensively, more so than many other works. Uh, in fact, I can only think of one other recent work that does that uh, at all. And uh, it's, I think it's really an important part of Kissinger's career. It, and I just wanna say as an aside, that one of the things that really puzzles me is why it is that no enterprising journalist has as yet uh, undertaken to write a book about Kissinger after 1977. There's so much to say. And even though the sources are hard to find, I think they are there. And it's not just that he was a media talking head or um, uh, an unofficial policy advisor, but he was a businessman. And I think uh, the fact that we know so little about Kissinger's role as a businessman in the last 40 plus years 
as the head of Kissinger Associates is a major lacuna in our understanding of US foreign relations, particularly with regard to China, but, but not exclusively. Yeah. So I have two questions for Tom. Uh, they're both very big picture questions and I'll just uh, say them both and then let Tom uh, respond. So the first is a very obvious question. It's about the relationship between Nixon and Kissinger. Of course, a big question for anybody who writes about uh, Kissinger um, is the fact that when we assess his role, we have to acknowledge that it was Nixon who was the president and who made the ultimate decisions. And in your conclusion, Tom, you write that Kissinger was a dutiful agent of Nixon. And you suggest that Kissinger's role was really important, both in providing a sort of intellectual framework, the realist framework, and in selling Nixon's policies. And I think you, you do a really terrific job at outlining how well, how deftly Kissinger cultivated the press to sell those policies. That suggests to me that your position is close to what Joan Hoff articulated in 1994 when Nixon reconsidered when she wrote that Kissinger was a geopolitical follower rather than a leader. And it's a contrast, I would say, to Jeremy's assessment in Jeremy's book um, that Kissinger was, and I'm quoting, a genius as a strategist. So Tom, you portray Kissinger more as a tactician. But I wanna press you on this point in relation to some of the specific episodes that you cover and how you present them. I think there are a number of really interesting points you make where you suggest that Kissinger triggered Nixon's reactions in ways that Kissinger would then later regret. That Kissinger was playing, Kissinger played on Nixon's anxieties, often to enhance his own power. So we'll take, for example, the invasion of Laos by South Vietnamese forces where Kissinger played a key role um, and Rogers, the Secretary of State, who yeah, I don't think anyone has ever written a single book on, on Rogers, um, but Rogers opposed it in very present ways. And it's one example of the many times that Kissinger pushed Nixon in certain directions, typically in many cases toward the use of force. So let me ask this question. Is it not the case that policymakers are never just dutiful agents, uh, but rather advisors whose perspectives, analyses and support or opposition uh, to various policies sometimes also gives them causal responsibility for those policies. And particularly at certain moments, aren't there not times when Kissinger does have a really high degree of personal responsibility and was in fact the decisive, may arguably have been the decisive factor. And I almost felt like you walked up to this conclusion a couple of times and then always had a caveat. Like there, there was also a national security reason uh, for what Kissinger was pushing. So my second question is also very big picture, um, and I'm sure you're, you've, you've fielded many questions along these lines over the years, Tom. It's about morality. And I, I think a lot about this quote that Jeremy pulled out of Kissinger during one of uh, Jeremy's interviews with Kissinger for, for his book, Henry Kissinger and the American Century. Jeremy asked Kissinger, what are your core moral principles? And Kissinger answered, I am not prepared to share that yet, which is pretty remarkable considering that he's you know, very happy to share opinions about pretty much anything. So Tom, in your conclusion, you do fault Kissinger for working against democracy in Chile, which you say undermined US national interests in 1970 to 73. And you fault him for what you describe as ignorance about Argentina's dirty war. But you also defend the bombing of Cambodia and even where you fault Kissinger, as in the case of Argentina, your language is um, tepid. So you say it's hard to justify. And the defense that you offer seems to be in part that everyone did what Nixon and Kissinger did, Kennedy, Eisenhower, it was just what Americans did in the Cold War. But you also said uh, that the um, claim that everything is justified because it was a Cold War necessity, which is basically the argument that Neil Ferguson makes, you said that um, argument is not very persuasive. 
And I want to really emphasize that I'm not suggesting that what you needed to do to satisfy me here <laughs> is, is not to offer a more vigorous condemnation of Kissinger or a more robust defense, because I can understand that you're trying not to do either. You just sort of want to avoid that whole thing. But to the extent that you weighed into that debate, I was left uncertain about your, your position. So let me ask um, let me frame, um, frame this in terms of this, this question. Do you think that Kissinger had a moral compass? And if he did not, or if it was not well articulated, shouldn't we expect statesmen to have well articulated moral principles? Thanks very much, Ara. Uh, two really excellent questions that also uh, uh, draw out a bit of the um, historiographical setting of, of, of Tom's book. So Tom, floor is yours. Wow. Um, excuse me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Still have a landline. Um, these are hard questions, um, needless to say, and I, I guess I kind of expected that from Ara. Um, they're tough. Uh, the Nixon-Kissinger relationship um, Yes, I do use the term dutiful follower. And I guess in that sense, I do think that um, foreign policy in the first Nixon years is Nixon's foreign policy. Um, uh, I think Kissinger, to borrow uh, William Sapphire's argument that he was a tuning fork relationship, I think he tuned himself into Nixon and he did oftentimes advocate uh, more forceful uh, measures uh, as he did, for example, on the Korean shoot down, uh, the North Korean shoot down of an American spy plane in 1969. Um, and I do think that is uh, uh, something about, particularly in the first years uh, in which um, Kissinger did uh, oftentimes try to read Nixon as a part of enhancing his own uh, prestige and importance with Nixon. Um, the National Security Advisor, unlike the Secretary of State, is a constituency of one the president, and I think uh, Kissinger was very aware of that. And uh, to a certain extent, he did, um, I think, uh, advocate policies uh, that played into uh, some of Nixon's own uh, inclinations toward the use of force. Specifically on Laos, I do think that um, was one where uh, Kissinger was persuaded that some type of use of force could strengthen uh, the uh, negotiating situation that he was still encountering in Paris and encourage Nixon in that way. Um, and in his memoirs was prepared to admit that Rogers was the one who was correct on that. Um, how much responsibility, uh, you know, I, for, for failures and for successes, I think it's there. Um, uh, you know, I think that um, Kissinger uh, Kissinger's role on uh, a number of these issues does give him a certain level of responsibility, although I do think in the end it's the president who makes those decisions. Uh, Kissinger learned not to doubt himself. Um, uh, Kiss Nixon had loved to use the analogy of Lot's wife, don't look back, you'll turn into a pillar of salt sort of thing, and encouraging Kiss Kissinger not to agonize over issues. Um, and Kissinger uh, learned to follow that and uh, I think uh, also came to enjoy greater um, uh, prestige or, or uh, a better relationship with Nixon because of that. Um, your, other, your other question on the, the issue of morality and do I think Kissinger had a moral compass? Well, the older I get, the more reluctant I am to judge other people's moral compasses in general. Um, I'm uh, probably uh, uh, more reluctant to make that case I think he did in, in some measure. I think it was, um, it was uh, uh, one that he could ignore at times, um, but I think his larger, one of the things that I think did drive him was this notion of keeping the United States from nuclear destruction. And that one way that would uh, be achieved would be a foreign policy that prevented disasters that could lead uh, to a situation in which the United States might engage in such uh, uh, aggressive behavior. Um, I think this meant that he was willing to make calculations about um, decisions such as in Chile and Argentina uh, that were uh, wrong um, or that, were, that ended up causing greater harm um, in Cold War calculations. Nevertheless, I do think there was 
in, in Kissinger's uh, overall sense that one of the most central things is the protection of the United States from destruction. I think there was that that is a moral principle and it's one that I think um, uh, he did uh, uh, advocate and keep. Um, trying to balance judgment on Henry Kissinger is tough. Um, I think it's, uh, he's a figure because of sometimes the, the language he used, uh, the callousness sometimes he could express, the sometimes even his rather uh, uh, more uh, macabre wit, um, as when he said about Chile, we shouldn't, uh, a country that's ir we, we shouldn't tolerate a country so irresponsible to vote for a Marxist, this sort of thing. I think it tends to bring out the, the greater hostility toward him among writers and, and analysts. Um, but I, I think in the end, uh, uh, driving or trying to, to reach a balanced judgment on Kissinger is essential. And I have no doubt that people will reach different balances over time. And, uh, um, and that mine is one framed very much around 2020. And um, I'm sure uh, in 50 years, it might strike a different balance. Um, nevertheless, I, I do think um, he did have a moral compass and that he did have some principles um, that he tried to adhere to. And I'm not surprised he wouldn't tell Jeremy them, but I, I, on the other hand, I'm not, uh, on the other hand, I, I wish, I, maybe I wish he had, but. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. We'll now turn uh, to Dr. Diane Kunz, who is the executive director of the Center for Adoption Policy, the preeminent legal and policy institute engaged in adoption and family creation issues at Duke University. Dr. Kunz has advised a number of US government agencies, including the State Department and the Centers for Disease Control. And she was one of the architects of the Haitian Humanitarian Parole Program, which brought over um, more than a thousand un unparented children uh, to their identified adoptive parents after the devastating 2010 earthquake. And she also helped uh, co-author the Help Haiti, Haiti Act of 2010, which granted US citizenship to these adopted children. After practicing law earlier in her career, she went on to study diplomatic and economic history at Oxford University, Yale University, and then went on to teach at Yale, at Columbia, and since 2010 uh, has been in various capacities at Duke University. So while at Yale, uh, she wrote a number of work extensively on 20th century history, uh, uh, wrote uh, uh, the prize-winning book, The Economic Diplomacy of the Suez Crisis, as well as Butter and Guns, The Economic Diplomacy of the Cold War. Uh, and we're delighted to have her now to provide some comments and questions to Tom. Diane, you have the floor. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here, uh, especially uh, in terms of both congratulating Tom, but also because of the connection with William Roger Lewis. Roger invited me to my first seminar at the Wilson Center in 1988. And it is marvelous. He was so important in helping me with my historical work on the Middle East. And we, I am in his debt as I think we all are. Tom, it's a wonderful book. Christian told me not to say too much about how good the book is, but I'm gonna keep on saying it. And what I was particularly struck by was the grace and humanity with which you wrote. This is an extraordinarily hard achievement given the word Kissinger, the name Kissinger and the name Nixon. And I say this because I was struck by one article that was written 10 years ago that the first line was, Richard Nixon is our Freddy Krueger. The idea, this is the normal set of terms and you have not done that. You have written a book with a sense of historical context of research but also understanding that Kissinger knew what he knew, what, what we don't know now. And that's the second great, I think, wonderful thing about your book is the fact that you use neither anachronistic views nor um, hindsight. And I was struck by this when I did research in the Nixon library at the same point that you were talking about earlier, Tom, the fact that they were so obsessed with the 72 election. And of course you're sitting there and you're saying, well, why are you obsessed? You want every state practically, but they were. And it, is, it doesn't, and you don't have that sense. It's almost a suspense book to read, you know, what's going to happen? Will the Vietnam Accords hold? You do that. And that leads, what I'm going to do is ask a number of some bigger, but some smaller questions and let you respond. 
And the first one was, I did a poll of young stu students, law students, young professionals. And I said, tell me the first three things you think about when you think about Kissinger's foreign policy. And what I got was Cambodia, Chile, and Argentina, and Indochina. No one mentioned China. No one mentioned Russia. No one mentioned the Middle East. And this, of course, is almost, it, it's strange. And so the, the question for you, one question is your book, what is so good about it is I think it goes very far to remedying this gap and saying these things you know about younger generation are within a much larger context. But I wonder how you would explain the lack of this larger picture and what you would say to students if you were uh, talking to them about this to give them the framework that the end of the Cold War being 30 years ago has obviously robbed from the way all of us saw history. So that's my first point. And then the second point, which we've all alluded to is the question about small countries. Because again, that's what people remember. Chile, Argentina, you know, the, the uh, human rights violations. How does Kissinger, you know, is it just that he sees them as, oh wow, Bangladesh may get in the way of my China relations, I better not let it distract me, or does he have a broader picture? And of course, as you say, in a book which could be, you know, Kissinger wrote 4,000 pages, you know, yours is but a, a, a tiny thing in, compared to that. Uh, you can't talk about these uh, secondary issues, but if you could address that. And I guess I'll stop with a, uh, two more. One is, morality, Barbara, you, you brought that up. And I, and I think and Jeremy brought it up in his book. And I was struck by something else because I am now writing a diplomatic and economic history of international adoption. And so I've been immersed among other things in the 1975 Vietnam baby lift, which Kissinger plays a very important role in that. And in also the evacuation of South Vietnamese uh, people who worked with the United States government. And in those fights, and he is fighting continuously with Congress, with uh, Schlesinger, uh, Secretary of Defense Schlesinger, he uses the word moral all the time. And he says, it is our moral obligation to help the people who helped us. Do you, and I wonder how much we could look back and say that there's a connection between his moral sense of our, uh, our allies in that context and what he experienced himself growing up in his own life. And finally, because I can't resist, I've got this picture here. I, I don't know that we can see that. There's Henry Kissinger in 1960 something. And this is truly a cultural question of interest to me because you've got the picture of Super K. And the fact of the matter is, and those of us can remember this, and you read about it in the 70s, he was a sex symbol. He was, an, okay, I want to keep showing this picture. Uh, he was the man about town. He was the Sinosure of all eyes. Can, I just cannot think of Alexander Haig, George Schultz, Mike Pompeo, uh, or um, in any of those terms. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about his prominence in American culture at that time. Thank you so much and congratulations again. Thanks, Dan. Tom, briefly. Okay, briefly. Yes, I see we're on. Um, small countries. I, I do think I do think the end of the Cold War, like, like many things in history, uh, when a, a larger context, uh, an issue ends successfully. Historians are not really good at successes and triumphs. We don't like them. We have even a, a, a disdain for any types of triumphalism, those sorts of things. So the end of the Cold War, which did was a great, in many respects, I think a great victory for freedom, uh, all that. But the result is that it, it leads to a second guessing about some of the steps that were taken during that time, even World War II. Um, subsequently, people looked at some of the measures undertaken during World War II and, and were criticized. So I do think some of the emphasis on many of the issues that you mentioned, Cambodia, Chile, and Argentina, does have to do with this, with the, uh, you might say, the uh, ends justify the means uh, 
as elements in the Cold War. And I, I have no doubt about that. And I think they, they're also very dramatic. They're quite emotional and, and they, they sort of are very gripping. I found the documentation on Cambodia, on Chile and Argentina very powerful. Um, but I do think that is part of the reason they're the things that are remembered and emphasized. Um, I do think um, on the small countries, I do think Kissinger, there was a tendency to disparage uh, the smaller countries. Uh, Kissinger did have something of that. Uh, uh, I've heard, uh, you know, the, um, um, I told this joke when I went down to Australia to lecture at, at ours university that Kissinger was once asked, why didn't you come to Australia? And he said, well, you know, if I, when next time I have a, a summit in Antarctica, I'll stop. Um, he, was, he was being disdainful about an ally in that way. And it was just not important. And I think to a certain extent, some of the decisions he made and some of the calculations about smaller countries do reflect some of that uh, larger thinking he had about the United States' role in the world. And again, going back even to the, to the nuclear and, and to the challenge of the communist world. Uh, Kissinger's, you, it's very interesting you bring up this issue of morality on the baby lift because he did start talking about the morality of saving South Vietnamese. Uh, the ironic thing is, of course, Kissinger had sort of expected South Vietnam to fall, but I think his expectation was that it would not happen quickly. It would not happen in a military undertaking. It would happen more uh, through slowly through subversion and even elections of some sort uh, would lead to the communists taking power. Um, and he did feel strongly uh, that we had that obligation, but he was just tarred and feathered in the press and by most uh, figures for even bringing up that subject on Vietnam, given the policy the administration had pursued. So he didn't get very far on that, but I do think it did reflect something of his notion that the people who are for you, you do anything for them ultimately, or you are willing to. I should say, of course, that he was at times willing to cut the uh, or, or throw people under the bus as he did with the Kurds and Iran and, and other situations. So that wasn't a universal uh, principle, but I think he did at times show a genuine concern for those who had uh, assisted the United States in wanting to help them. So I, I do, I'm aware of that. The sex symbol thing, I think I actually do have an argument there that's beyond the popular culture that is simply that Kissinger did exploit the media's fascination with the idea that he had this appeal. He was a charming man and he, he charmed a number of these actresses and you know, he was very smart and he uh, could, could carry on a conversation and uh, was, was also showed an ability to listen uh, that was very appealing. Um, he is known for the quote, the power is the ultimate aphrodisiac, which I suppose in the Me Too era sounds, has a very tinnish sound and probably uh, would get him into more trouble, but he was, he was genuinely, I mean, and these relationships were actually all uh, very, uh, for the most part, I mean, all of these people spoke very fondly of Henry and, you know, very much uh, admired him. But I do think the media had a certain fascination with the idea of an intellectual as a sex symbol and that uh, gave, it was another part of Kissinger's ability to, to uh, uh, deal with journalists, to deal with um, media figures and to take advantage of the things that they uh, were, that appealed to them in what was a relatively colorless administration. He could be this sort of unusual figure. And I, I can't tell you the number of times in which it's commented upon in some of the TV commentary of the time that this nebbish looking guy was this sex symbol. And it was something that um, added to, I think, the allure of Henry Kissinger. And it was a, a part of that fascination and ultimately, I argue, a part of his power. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, before we get to our third commentator, let me just note that once we get to the Q&A with our broader audience um, out there, um, please use the um, uh, hands uh, raising function in the chat um, function of Zoom to get in line. So if you um, have a question, please um, use that, um, that uh, hand raise function. And we will try to call on you if, um, if we have um, time. Now, uh, Dr. Keyes and Dr. Kunz have asked um, quite a number and some very tough questions. So um, uh, any, uh, you know, another commentator might have a hard time. Um, if there's one who can pull this off, it's Jeremy. And um, we're, we're very grateful uh, for you to have also joined this panel. Jeremy, great to see you. Uh, Professor Jeremy Suri holds the Mac Brown Distinguished Chair for Leadership in Global Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin, educated at Stanford, Ohio University and Yale with a PhD from Yale. He's a professor in the university's history 
city department and um, the L Lyndon Johnson School of Public Affairs. He's the author and editor of 10 books on contemporary politics and foreign policy. His most recent book is The Impossible Presidency, The Rise and Fall of America's Highest Office. And as has been noted in this context, he also authored a biography of Kissinger, Henry Kissinger and the American Century, published in 2009. His writings appear widely in blogs and print media, and he's a frequent public lecturer and guest on radio and television programs. He hosts a weekly podcast, This is Democracy, available through his professional webpage, jeremysuri.net. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Jeremy, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Christian. And uh, let me begin by uh, congratulating Tom. Uh, actually, Tom and Diane, I've known since I began my graduate student career and have, have both been, both Diane and Tom have been really uh, so important uh, to my uh, development as a scholar and my continuing <laughs> growth and learning as a scholar. So it's really a pleasure to be here. It's also a pleasure to be part of an event. This is the second time I've been part of a William Roger Lewis uh, lecture at the, at the Wilson Center and to be able to honor uh, right. a wonderful colleague and friend, William Roger Lewis. Uh, uh, it's really wonderful to be a part of this. So let me let me jump right in. Um, I, I want to echo all the nice and, and laudatory things people said about Tom's book. It certainly deserves those. And I want to add one more to what others have said. Uh, I, I, I really enjoyed this book. And I read it twice. I read it in, in page proofs and then I read it in the, in the final version. Uh, I really enjoyed it because it made me think. It's a book about Kissinger that really makes you think about American power and the development of the United States. It's, it's really using Kissinger as an insight into those issues. And that's in fact what all of us on this panel have done in our writing about the, these issues. The book, it seems to me, rests on a series of paradoxes or the, the phrase that Tom uses borrowing from Morgenthau is polytropus. That, that, um, um, Kissinger is a polytropist, a pilimcest uh, in, in a certain way, that there's everything there and it goes in all directions at, at one time. He can be charming and incredibly obnoxious. Uh, he can be incredibly insightful and quite frankly, very superficial uh, at times. He can be incredibly narcissistic, but he can also understand and empathize with others in a negotiating framework in which most narcissists aren't able to do. So there's something of everything in Kissinger and Tom brings that out really well. And I really enjoyed, and Tom's the only author I know who has really run with the idea of Kissinger as a political animal, as that being the central element. And I think it fits, as Tom himself says from his first chapter, with the anxiety of influence that Kissinger has from the start, the desire for power, the desire for power for good, the desire for, for power for self-interest, and the trauma of having seen what happens when you don't have power. And I think that's something all of us have agreed on in, in looking at uh, Henry Kissinger. So the three paradoxes that stand out to me, I just want to flag them. Uh, and then I want to ask a couple of questions about them. And I'll try to do this uh, quickly. Uh, first, uh, Tom makes the case, as he has, and he makes it very persuasively, that Kissinger is a political animal. But he also makes the case, and the book shows this, and others have shown this as well, that Kissinger is a political animal who hates American politics. He hates Congress. Congress gets very little mention in the book, and Tom is a scholar of Congress, I know, but Congress gets very little mention in the book because Congress is a nuisance for Henry Kissinger throughout, even before he's in office, when he's in office. He doesn't like elections either. He likes celebrity activities. He doesn't like elections, he doesn't like Congress. I say, if you don't like elections, you don't like Congress, uh, you're not a political animal in the American context. So how do we make sense of that? that there's a tension there. Um, that's not a question, I'm just sort of putting that out there. I found that fascinating. Second paradox, he sees the weakness of democracy. Tom has some really thoughtful passages on where Kissinger, he says, echoing Tocqueville and others, sees the weaknesses of democratic procedures. It's a point Kennan, George Kennan made as well. It's a point many uh, foreign policy thinkers in the United States have made. But yet at the same time, Tom's entire book is about how Kissinger exploits those procedures, exploits the uh, spaghetti-like nature of American institutions turns the National Security Council, which was created by Truman and Eisenhower to be a planning and administrative body into this kind of, uh, as Andrew Preston has called the little White House, and then into sort of a little shop in which he can make policy on his own. Uh, he's exploiting the weaknesses. In fact, one way to read Tom's uh, book is that Kissinger could not have been a politically successful animal in any other society, because the things he, he does are so sui generis to the American system, to the nature of interlocking checks and balances and the power that the White House has uh, and the opportunity the United States has to use that power in the Cold War. So there's this paradox about seeing the weakness of democracy, 
but is also exploiting those weaknesses as the sources of his own strength. Um, and then there's a third paradox, which is one I think all of us on this panel have, have written about, and Tom brings this up very well. Kissinger is a declinist. He's acutely aware from his Spenglerian writing, the longest thesis at Harvard that's largely about this, uh, about how empires rise and fall, as Paul Kennedy says, and we're in the fall stage. But yet he, um, he believes he can ex extend American power. Tom makes this point time and again, uh, that Kissinger's urge is to extend power, not to conserve power to extend power, not to conserve power. That's also a paradox there that comes through, I think, very well in Tom's books. So here are my questions. And these are questions in part inspired uh, by the moment we're in. I'm not gonna talk about Donald Trump, but he, as with everything else, his orange hair is hanging over us. And if we were there right now, he would be within, you know, I don't know. I guess with all the walls around the White House, he wouldn't be very close to us, but he would, would be close to us. Uh, so here, here are questions. And, and these questions come from the strength of this book. I think there are questions I was led to think about deeply because of the incredible work that Tom has done. Uh, abuse of power by the executive. Uh, Kissinger is right there in the belly of the beast in the prior example we would point to before the one we're in right now. Uh, Tom is clear that he doesn't believe, he says this a few times as a size, if you read carefully, he doesn't believe that Kissinger didn't know about the plumbers. He finds that hard to believe, but he also doesn't believe Kissinger is responsible for Watergate either. Uh, what is his role in this? Insofar as he extends executive power in ways that no other NSC advisor did, and then becomes, as Tom says in one of his chapters, in essence, the foreign policy president who no one elected, going to the point with Al Haig of raising the nuclear alert, Tom covers this very well, without even consulting the president in 1973. To what extent are the abuses of power we see Thereafter, are they connected to Kissinger? How much of his story is the story of the abuse of executive power? Uh, I asked him that once and he was very, very angry. So I, I hope Tom will not be as angry in answering that as, as he was. Uh, second, for a political animal in a democratic political context, why does he love dictators so much? That doesn't negate the argument that he might be a political animal, but it again is not what you would expect. It's not what you would expect. Uh, Ronald Reagan, who at times certainly was willing to work with dictators, really had this belief that other societies were eventually going to reform and become more democratic. He, he had an, a, an, an, an appeal, a connection, he believed, to what he believed would happen as societies changed and in his mind progressed toward democracy. Kissinger has none of that. How do we reconcile him being a political animal in our context, someone who also saw the horrors of dictatorship? I struggled with this when I was writing about him. He saw the horrors of dictatorship, but yet finds himself very comfortable in that framework. You show that so well, Tom. And then, and then third, and really most interesting to me is, why is it that someone who is such a political animal, and as you show in your last chapter, does such a good job to keep himself in the game, in the game at the same time at the same time, how can he be so unwilling to take on self-criticism? Politicians flip-flop all the time, just like professors do. We have to, right? Our students change. We have to say different things. The world changes. I teach reconstruction differently now from how I taught it five years ago. Part of it's being in Texas, but part of it's seeing that, you know what? Less, less was accomplished in reconstruction than I thought five years ago as I look around activities in our society. We change, right? Even though he has managed as a celebrity to remain connected to figures even like Hillary Clinton, as you point out, he seems so unwilling, so unwilling to play the game that most other politicians do, what I think Robert McNamara did brilliantly, which is to apologize, express regret, and blame someone else. Right? McNamara's argument is uh, terrible things happened in Vietnam. I feel horrible about it, and it was Lyndon Johnson's fault. Why isn't Kissinger doing that? Why, why, why can he not let go? I think that's significant to us because I think one of the uh, real challenges we face as a country is how do we, loving our country, how do we accept, how do we express our own self-criticism? How can we look out into the world, right? Obama struggled with this, not effectively. He, extra he struggled with this, I think, honestly, right? How can we see and admit to our mistakes and actually turn that to our advantage rather than try to cover them up. And it does strike me that perhaps after November, and certainly I hope after November, we will be in that position as a country. Uh, how are we gonna do that? Uh, 
how can we learn in that sense from what Kissinger has, has not done? So uh, again, uh, the, these topics come out of just, I think the, the depth of the work you've done here, Tom, uh, it's a wonderful book. And I, I do wanna encourage everyone to, to, to read it and buy multiple copies. I know that'll make Tom very happy. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Um, great questions. Tom? Um, uh, wow. Um, Jeremy poses some excellent points, and I appreciate very much um, what he said about the book, making him think. I, you know, that that's probably the highest praise you can give an author, that you've actually gotten them to think about something new. I know that that certainly is one of the things that I hope to do in the book was to get people think about these subjects. On the abuse of power uh, by the executive, well, yes, I think it's, Kissinger was one of these figures. He, in a way, his own uh, concern about leaks, of course, was one of the driving things that led Richard Nixon or that encouraged Richard Nixon on a path he probably would have gone on anyway to uh, uh, get the plumbers and that, Kissinger had a connection to, through some of the people who worked on his staff as well. One of them has written a fascinating doctoral dissertation, and I, I certainly encourage people uh, to look that up. But I, I, think, I think Kissinger, this is where Kissinger's, um, and, uh, both being political and non-political, paid off. In a way, the image he shaped, the president doesn't talk to me about domestic politics, was something that the media was more than happy to believe and very happy to buy into and give him a pass. There's a wonderful line, Walter Cronkite at his 50th birthday party for Kissinger um, was asked what they gave him. And he said, we gave him a pardon. Um, and and the, Walter Cronkite as the network person saying that, it, it was this notion that, well, yes, he might have known these things, but we don't care. He's not like them. And Kissinger, I think this was one of his geniuses in some ways was, keeping a certain distance from American politics that you suggested in other ways is, is also a paradox, but also it, it played to um, his favor in this context that he uh, was able not to be drawn down by the abuses of Watergate. And in fact, Nixon also served a role in that by elevating him and thinking that that would save his presidency. Um, I don't know uh, what, to the extent that, I think Kissinger, there is, Kissinger was annoyed by Congress, no question. I mean, Kissinger didn't believe Congress deserved the role that it was trying to assert on foreign policy. And let's face it, in American history, we've gone back and forth on this. We've had periods of time which Congress did play a significant role, but Congress is a, is a tough institution to do foreign policy. We've admired more presidents that have directed foreign policy. I think, I, I think um, we admire, for example, a George H.W. Bush who led foreign policy and in some ways, would H.W. came close to defying Congress over the Persian Gulf War. So I, I don't think, I, I think on this, on this question of where, where the separation of powers lies in foreign policy, I, I go back to the old line that it's an invitation to struggle. It's, good, it's a struggle that's gone on throughout the American history. And I, I, I'm not sure that, I, I, I'm not defending Kissinger on everything there, but I, I think this question of um, his responsibility for the abuses has to be uh, put into that context. Why did he love dictators? Well, <laughs> you could make deals with dictators, or at least this was the perception he had. Um, and you know, the best the best contrast. I mean, you know, the, uh, obviously the unsavory ones in Latin America is not a good example. But the best context is, of course, Anwar Sadat. That Anwar Sadat could basically bring Egypt around and change its whole foreign policy orientation. And Kissinger, to Kissinger, this was a huge achievement. It changed the whole dynamics of the Middle East. Um, and at the same time, it drove him crazy, the Israeli parliament and the Israeli political system and its, its tendency to, uh, you know, to, 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 to pound him down on every concession that was being made. I mean, it, it's ironic, of course, that in retrospect, you see this as, as, as someone who was really defending Israel. At the time, he was, of course, excoriated by many Israelis for not being um, sufficiently supportive. So I, I think that's probably the answer, obviously, you know, in, in many respects, uh, that's you know, well, we've had presidents who've liked dictators since. Yes, uh, contemporary, right now we're dealing with one who seems to have an unnormal fondness for them, but it, it's not terribly surprising, again, that dictators have a certain appeal. Jimmy Carter, one of the most moral men ever to be in the White House, loved Anwar Sadat. Um, so this gives some idea, I think, here. Uh, finally, your last point about uh, his unwillingness to 
undertake self-criticism. Uh, you know, I, I take your point that, you know, in many ways, I think on an individual level, self-criticism is a great thing. We, we need to teach different, all of those sorts of things. I'm not so sure it works politically. Yes, maybe in the context of academia, but you know, um, it, it's costly to acknowledge your mistakes and you know, the Bill Clinton apologies and things like that come to be. There is, I think Americans are torn on that issue. On the one hand, I think there is an inclination to like someone who says the hell with you, I'm, I'm sticking to my guns, this sort of thing. Um, versus the more empathetic and uh, willingness to acknowledge these things. And I, I'm not, I, I think that, you know, Robert McNamara's apology got hammered um, in the New York Times at the time. And I, I think Kissinger had a certain awareness that you can't apologize to say it, it's it, in a way you will be hammered one way or the other on whatever you choose. It, it may be a reflection, maybe, um, you know, maybe in the depth of his soul, Kissinger does think about these things or is prepared to, but I watched, uh, uh, just to get back into the frame of mind, I watched the documentary that Neil Ferguson did of Kissinger and the, particularly the last line where he says, basically, I would have done the same things, uh, you know, uh, uh, much as it was painful and all of that. So I, I think you're right that he doesn't seem to have that particular characteristic, but I'm not so sure that it is uh, politically um, as advantageous um, or even politically as appealing as it might seem right now um, when we, we may, may, may face that issue in a few months. Thank you. Thank you, Ara, Diane, and Jeremy for some uh, really thoughtful, um, provocative, um, brilliant questions to kind of lead us into the discussion. I'd like to open it up now to questions from our viewers. Um, again, please use the raise hand function in the um, Zoom chat um, function to uh, register your interest to ask a question. Um, and you can also email uh, us through the National History Center uh, with questions. Well, let me call first on Anne Louise Hiddle. Uh, Anne Louise Hiddle, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. You will be unmuted and or unmute, try to unmute yourself and then please pose your question. Brief questions and brief answers. Please unmute yourself. Uh, I should be unmuted now. You are. Yep, okay. you are. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'll be. I'll try to be very brief. Um, I actually worked at uh, Kissinger Associates, and so, and I have not read the book yet, uh, but I am definitely going to run out and buy the book and read it. Uh, and I was interested in the point about the fact that you did address his years after he left the government and uh, any perspectives that you might have made or had on his consulting firm years at Kissinger Associates. It certainly uh, was an incredibly enlightening experience for me to work for him because he only had three research associates and I learned a lot, but I'm also curious if, if you were able to really get into that at all in your book. Uh, and I agree with the comment that it would be a great area to cover uh, because it, it's been, it was a fascinating time. So thank you for taking my question. Thank you. And uh, let me just, the, the, you know, Tom will have an opportunity to respond, but um, Ara, Diane, um, Jeremy, feel free to, to chime in as well. So Tom? Yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that I really don't do a lot with Kissinger Associates and Ara makes that noted that. And I, I, you know, I do think there's a book there. Um, I think what's interesting there is of course that Kissinger uh, Kissinger's reputation was so uh, enhanced by his role in government that people really did believe he, he had access to Chinese leaders and others. Um, Kissinger and globalization is obviously a topic that some enterprising doctoral student who maybe has not been born yet will someday do um, in terms of globalization and the Kissinger Associates uh, records and the rest. Um, I, think, I think Kissinger certainly played a role in that. Uh, I reread recently the last piece that Kissinger uh, published in the Wall Street Journal, and I was struck by um, when he was, this was a piece back in April where he was talking about the impact of the pandemic on international relations. And one of the things he says in there is the necessity for 
uh, prosperity, to have global trade and global interchange. This is still something he really truly believes in this time of, of tariffs and, and all sorts of other things. And so I think his role in that will be, of course, of great significance and importance to, to document. Thank you. Eric, I think you would like to pose a question. Yes, thanks. Tom, in your epilogue, you write, uh, I quote from your book, uh, determined not to fade away from public life, Kissinger waged an extraordinarily successful campaign to remain politically relevant, unquote. That relevance, as I read the book, seems to be more in the realm of celebrity than in influence or consequence. Uh, and so while he tries to remain in the spotlight, his ideas seem less enduring or consistent. Reagan's, Reagan's team uh, upends detente, uh, his signature endeavor. Uh, jumping ahead, you note that uh, uh, Kissinger opposed multilateralism under Obama, objected to his failure to act against the Assad regime uh, and Russian intervention in Syria. But then Kissinger is a frequent visitor of the Trump White House, whose actions in Syria should have sent Kissinger's head spinning. Uh, an interviewer, you note, once observed that he went to quote, great lengths to preserve access to people in power at the expense of not speaking plainly in public. And this is after Trump's incredible press conference with Putin in Helsinki. Uh, and Kissinger's response to this was something of a waffle. He hardly offered scathing criticism. So Kissinger doesn't fade away. He remains, as you put it, a successful self-promoter but he doesn't appear to be particularly politically relevant. Am I reading this wrong? Well, I think, I think it's a, uh, uh, I think it depends on when you're talking about. When he first leaves the White House, he is very politically relevant to the Carter administration. And I make the argument he's the shadow secretary of state. He is very much in their minds. Um, and I think in the eighties, he was relevant to, in the sense that he had a platform that criticized at times Reagan administration initiatives and really called for, and, and that at times criticized on, on Russia and other things that he was being seen, he was seeing the president quite frequently. I do think in more recent years and particularly some of the ones you're talking about in the Obama period and the rest, he's less relevant. Um, but I do think that uh, in the period of time, uh, it was obviously he was more relevant and was listened to more and sort of had access during Republican presidencies. Um, even though he did continue to maintain the illusion that he was nonpartisan, um, that uh, Bill Clinton didn't really have much time for him. And, and Barack Obama didn't either. But I think the Bushes in their own way did and used him when they could. Mm -hmm. And George uh, W. Bush actually brought him in on a number of occasions. Yes. And, and Bush's arguments about Iraq, well, we don't know for sure, or, or Kissinger's arguments about not withdrawing, or at least you know, the withdrawal would be similar to uh, salted peanuts, the famous connection he made to his <laughs> Vietnam. We, we don't know whether that had influence. Of course, it was in a Bob Woodward book, and we know Bob Woodward. So it may have, may or may not have been a, a significant point. So I, I, I wouldn't go as far as you say to, to say that he was not relevant. I think it varied, and he had more access and more influence, uh, largely in Republican administrations. And now with, um, with Trump, I think it's the relationship with Jared Kushner and the sense that uh, Kushner has this uh, relationship and believes that Kissinger knew a lot about the Middle East and that even if Syria, in Syria, the policy is different, um, what he's doing in Israel and those issues are something that he's talking to Henry Kissinger about. I would just add one other example of Kissinger's influence long after he's in office uh, is at the end of the Cold War when he's brought in by the George H.W. Bush administration uh, after first criticizing the INF and START treaties, then comes in and actually suggests a deal with Gorbachev for a permanent uh, division of Europe, right, with a Soviet, condom a Soviet condominium and an American condominium in Europe. Uh, and the Bush people, by most accounts, take it pretty seriously. They obviously reject that in part because of events on the ground. Uh, but he's, he's one of the key people they're consulting on what to do at the end of the Cold War. Thank you. Let me call on Ann Dayton next. Ann Dayton next, and then we'll go to um, Charles Mayer. Ann? Um, can you hear you can me hear now? You now? Yes. Hello. Um, can you hear? Yes. Yes. Good. Excellent. Hello. I'm calling Hello. you from outside Oxford, so it's late in the evening. Um, 
I thought it was a fantastic talk. And it came over to me that uh, Kissinger was, yes, a man for his time, a clever man who understood complexity and could manage, could juggle many balls in the air at once. And the complexity of America's role in the world at the time that he was um, in, the, in the early and mid to the late 70s. The question I have for you is, is it, it may be a, a bit unfair, but do you think, Tom, that he was an American phenomenon? Do you think that that kind of advisor who can penetrate power political systems, can penetrate the institutional framework and, and survive is something that's particularly American? Of course, I'm just wondering at the back of my mind whether Boris Johnson couldn't do with a Kissinger at the moment, of course. Um, but if you could answer that question as a historian, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going, to steal, I'm going to steal from Jeremy, who I think was absolutely right when he said one of the reasons Kissinger could come into the American context is he could exploit uh, the, the um, division of powers, the, uh, the president's need for him, the use of him as a, as a, a person to carry out particular uh, missions that are designed for domestic political impact as well and be loyal to him in that context. So I do think he is something of an American phenomenon. The problem with having a Kissinger is the danger that the Kissinger ends up overshadowing you. And that was, of course, what ultimately, one of the things that ultimately did hurt Gerald Ford was the sense that Kissinger overshadowed him in foreign policy and that, Kissinger, that Ford could not even explain Kissinger's foreign policy when he was in that debate. And I do think that's the, the problem. Um, and that was one of the reasons why you don't see a Kissinger subsequent uh, in the administration, say, of, of uh, Reagan or Bush because of a fear that they, they somehow just detract from the uh, power of the president. And, and so I, I, in that sense, I think Kissinger was both an American phenomenon, but like, like Nixon taping his conversations, these are things that happened in the Nixon years that won't happen again. And I think both no president's going to tape themselves and no president's probably going to empower an advisor in the same manner in which Richard Nixon did. It was a I think something for a brief time in an American context. Maybe it'll happen when people have forgotten some of this down the line. I would never say never in history, but uh, I think it was also a lesson for subsequent presidents not to do this. Just as all Thank presidents learn not to talk to Bob Woodward. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> next, next, we go to Charles Mayer from Harvard University. Charlotte. Hi. Uh, this, uh, Tom, uh, this is a wonderful book. Uh, I have to say something later, but I, I really enjoyed it. It's a taught book. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, as, as Diane said, it covers so much in, in a very economical con context uh, or uh, compass. Uh, my question, it's, it's partially an observation, is that there's so much of, Henry is, deals with the American system, as you say, so well, but he is a he remains in so many senses, I think, a European when he thinks about politics and statecraft. And I'd like to you know, comment on that. My sense is, if I were trying to sum up his career, he was great with dealing with states, with organized states, uh, even our own crazy state. But he had no ear, no, no sympathy for anything like a popular movement. And, uh, uh, and I think this, this explains a lot as to why he, uh, uh, how he could, you know, cope with China, Russia, but not with Vietnam in any sense. And, you know, he was, he, he had written a book which, you know, praised equilibrium above all. I think if there was a moral idea that you asked about earlier, it would be one of trying to seek equilibrium as well. But my sense is that uh, the, the dichotomy between dealing with states, which is a kind of, you know, traditional German idea and dealing with peoples uh, dealing with people sort of uh, totally evaded him. I just like to hear you talk about that. I, th I think, Charlie, that's a, a very fair assessment that uh, he was someone whose work in, and in many respects um, uh, was someone who could deal with states. Uh, the Middle East is, is also an interesting example in that, in that he had, it was easier for him to deal with a Sadat and Assad than it was to deal with Arafat and the PLO, even if he could have dealt with them legally, um, uh, he did make these efforts. Um, yes, yeah, I think, I think that was Kissinger's universe. Um, it was his understanding. 
And again, uh, Jeremy kind of brought this out as well, because I think part of Kissinger's distaste for America stemmed from still being in many respects very European in his approach and thinking about politics and statecraft. And yes, I would, I think that is the, uh, uh, that is one of the things that which he was not as, as capable of in dealing with. He did try, the interesting thing is he, he, he tried to understand the anti-war movement. He tried to actually meet with people from the anti-war movement in the United States. He actually, this is an admirable thing because none of the Nixon people seem to have been doing that. And he did try. I don't think, I think it, it did, it gave him some idea of what was going on, but it, it still was a difficult um, uh, intellectual uh, thing for him to truly understand. But um, I, I would take your point very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Sergei Rachenko next, and then I have Nancy Mitchell and Kenton Clymer. Sergei? Um, unmute yourself. Oh, yeah. okay. I know I'm, did I unmute myself now? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Thanks, uh, thanks, Christian, and thanks for the talk, Tom. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, this discussion of Kissinger after Kissinger, that career, you know, if, if, you, if you ever get to writing about that, again, a different book, I, I just wanted to draw your attention to one particular source. Uh, you know that Kissinger, the breeding channel that is well known and well documented on the US side, it continues after Kissinger retires, as it were. He continues to see the Soviet ambassador, uh, and these documents are available now in Russia. And it's absolutely remarkable just to see these conversations, uh, to read them. You know, he, he trashes big Brzezinski, he laments, <laughs> he laments the demise of detente, even though he handsomely contributed uh, to it while he was Secretary of State. So that's certainly something to to think about. But anyway, my question is about something else. You mentioned that briefly, but that moment in 1973, in October 1973, when Kissinger raises DEFCON to DEFCON 3, uh, the Soviets are absolutely shocked by what happens. And then later, they, you know, uh, the, the Brynian, Brezhnev, they all ask Kissinger, you know, why did you do that? You could just call us, you know, you could have just sent a letter or something. Why did you bring the world to the brink of a nuclear war? They certainly did not think that this was worth it. Uh, and, and, and you know what Kissinger says, he actually, remarkably, he actually blames Nixon. He said, yeah, Nixon, he is, he is really on the verge, you know, there's Watergate and he is under, uh, under such attack. So my question is this, first of all, why did Kissinger do that? We know Kissinger was the one who did it, not Nixon, who was out uh, of it uh, throughout that night. And, and secondly, why did he blame Nixon? Thanks, Sergey. Um, Tom? Uh, good questions. Um, I would love to see some of those conversations with the Soviet ambassador. I mean, I, I, I have no doubt that you're characterizing them accurately because it does sound like something Kissinger would have done. But um, we're, we're, why did we're he do it? Publish them. Oh, excellent, great. Um, uh, why did he do it? I make the case in the book that there was a strong domestic political reason, a belief that authority was under attack in the United States and that this was a way of showing that the United States could still act forcefully in, in, in foreign policy. There was a fair amount of suspicion of Soviet motives, but I think this one of the key motivations there was this sense that weakness in the domestic, uh, the perception of weakness because of the challenges in, uh, to domestic authority that Watergate had brought about. Nixon was under a fire for, uh, Agnew had resigned, Nixon was now under fire because he had fired Archibald Cox. And I think that notion that impeachment was rising as an idea that led Kissinger to think in that way, that this would be a forceful way to reassert American power. Um, why does he blame Nixon? Well, why not? I mean, in a sense, this gives him a, a way to um, tell the Soviets, well, that wasn't, that was Nixon, not, not me. And, you know, this was something, I mean, Kissinger did this a lot. I mean, he, uh, when he went over to negotiate with the Soviets on the Jackson Vanek, he sort of said, I'm on your side. You, you know, he, he, this was a style of his uh, oftentimes to um, uh, uh, not exactly uh, uh, convey the truth in, in, a, in to foreign adversaries when he was trying to achieve something. So I'm, I'm not at all surprised that that happens to be the case. That's Thanks, Tom. Super yeah, sure. Because I have an alternate explanation of, of the nuclear alert in my article, which I won't get into now. It's not my place, but I just want to say there is a really interesting phone call between Kissinger and Gabrina in which Kissinger basically apologizes for calling that alert, saying, I didn't need to do it. Interesting. Thank you. We will actually, we're, we're planning to publish um, the second tranche of, of, of the back channel. Um, 
through the Wilson Census Digital Archive at digitalarchive.org um, uh, at some point um, in the future. Uh, let me go to um, who's next, Kenton Clymer and then Nancy Mitchell. Kenton. Unmute yourself, please. Here we go. Yeah, okay. You can hear me now. Yes. Good. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, very interesting uh, afternoon. It's been delightful. Um, I had a couple of questions. One, just a small little question out of curiosity, whether, Tom, whether you um, actually made any efforts to speak with Kissinger while you were writing the book. Uh, and the second more substantive one is uh, on the Cambodia question. Um, Aside from the bombing, um, I, I've always thought that one of the major tragedies of American foreign policy in that period was Kissinger's uh, refusal really to try to engage Sihanouk, who was in uh, exile and who desperately wanted to speak with the United States from at least 1971 on. And Kissinger always dismissed quite contemptuously those um, efforts. I just wondered if you had an opinion about that. Um, yes, I did try to, to speak with Kissinger and did have a chance in the early stages of the project and then would see him several times. I actually got a chance to ask him a question about the decent interval at the uh, State Department's conference on Vietnam in 2010. And, um, uh, you know, he, I think, I think meeting Kissinger was important for me as a, just to get a sense of the man. I, there was nothing in the information in a sense that I got out of it that, that he's not written or published in any other context. So I didn't have, in, in that sense, the, the, the sort of sustained uh, set of, of, of um, opportunities that Jeremy did. I, it was very different in that sense. On Cambodia, I think the, the unwillingness to, to meet with Sihanouk has puzzles me in some ways. Um, I think it does fit with Kissinger's sense that Sihanouk uh, uh, had lost by, by aligning with the Khmer Rouge and, and by going to uh, Beijing and that, that he had lost that authority and that he no longer really spoke for anyone but himself and that Kissinger in that sense um, uh, all, did not think that it would be a useful uh, a, a use of his time to speak with him. But I, I think that, uh, you know, that the, the, on Cambodia, I think there's all sorts of things that, that Kissinger does. Uh, at times that uh, are puzzling and could partly be explained by his contempt for smaller powers, uh, but partly also um, this, this sense that, uh, uh, that the people to negotiate with on Cambodia were the ones who had real power. And uh, the North Vietnamese particularly at one time, which I think might have been a misconception and then uh, the Chinese. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Good, we're coming to uh, uh, the, um, the end of our time. So let me um, call on Nancy Mitchell and Steve Brady for brief questions. And then I'll have one question that uh, we got through the website and we'll, we'll, we'll take Tom, uh, if you could wait and we'll take those three question uh, first and then give you a final chance and the other panelists if they'd like to, uh, um, to, to respond as well. So Nancy. Um. First, I'd just like to thank Tom and, and say this has been very interesting. Um, I have not yet read the book and I'm fascinated, Tom, um, by your comment that Kissinger is above all a political animal. It seems to me in what you're saying in this talk is more that he was a media animal, um, that he was a charismatic and even seductive um, salesman of his own importance more than a political animal. So I would just like you to briefly um, clarify what exactly you mean by stressing that he was a political animal. Thank you. Uh, let me call on Steve Brady. Hey, Tom. Uh, I have not been asked to limit my uh, you know, praise, but I will. Uh, so, um, and this kind of follows up on the last question. Uh, you, there was a, there's a, been a lot written on Kissinger, and yet there was an opening for a scholar to write about Kissinger as a, as Professor Surrey said, political animal, um, and Kissinger in politics. So uh, to make it really quick, one reason for that is probably the bias of scholars. They're very interested in writing about him and the bigger sort of strategic international relations issues. Uh, but secondly, was he particularly good at hiding his political uh, capacities? Or a third possibility, he just wasn't that good at it in the end. 
<laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, let me pose a question that, that came to us via the chat function, function from Alfred Beagle. Has Kissinger given his support, um, has given his support to, uh, to Trump's foreign policy, particularly on his concept of uncertainty, question mark? What likely changes was, would Kissinger recommend to Trump in the directions of US policy toward China, Israel, in relations with NATO? It's a pretty big question, but um, a Trump question to, um, to, to close off this round. Tom, over to you. Um, I think it's interesting that Nancy asked me, you know, that he's not a political animal, he's a media animal, but we have a president who's a political and media animal. I mean, those two are not mutually exclusive by any means. Uh, and in a way, one of the things I argue is that Kissinger used the media to enhance his political authority um, within the White House and uh, the rest. So I, I do, you know, he sought political power. And I think that's where I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that he recognized um, that uh, political power, no foreign policy can be made without requisite political support and standing. And in, in effect, he understood that the best, the most theoretical foreign policy would never be enacted without political uh, backing and support. And Kissinger sought it. He, he learned in some ways and helped Nixon uh, gain it. But then when he gained it himself, when Nixon was faltering, he tried to consolidate it. And um, I make the point that when he was with Ford, he almost, he talked to Ford as though they were partners in power. And this was something that's really quite remarkable. But he, he uh, I think in that sense, um, he was both. Um, I don't think they're exclusive. I think he understood that in 20th century America, uh, media celebrity can be power. And he, um, he took advantage of that. And um, in that sense, I, I suppose also that goes to, to Steve's point is I think he was good at it sometimes. He wasn't good at it all all the time and he, he, he had his faults on that and, and that was not always able to be as successful um, in carrying out policies, especially uh, toward the end of uh, the time with the Ford, during the Ford administration. Uh, Kissinger on Trump is very hard to talk about because Kissinger has been very, very careful on what he said. So I'm, I'm gonna be cautious here. Uh, again, I did reread the piece that he wrote, um, the last piece he wrote on the pandemic and even though he does not mention Trump explicitly, he's quite critical of the idea that the pandemic can be dealt with on a national basis, argues again, the support for the liberal world order, the significance of that. So I think that um, even though he probably um, uh, in one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations is quite cautious about how he expresses criticism, uh, recognizing a narcissist when he sees one, um, he is not, he probably does make the case that these are institutions and other things that have benefited the United States. And yes, issues with China do have to be resolved, but the, the relationship still has beneficial aspects to, to the United States. And that NATO has beneficial aspects to the United States and should not uh, simply be seen as a, a, a sort of a, an accounting issue of how much each country gives uh, percentage-wise. So I I don't, uh, I don't pretend to know what, what Kissinger might have been saying to Trump, but at least in, in some of his published stuff, I get the sense that he is still maintaining support for more traditional approaches to American foreign policy. Thank you, excellent. And uh, Ara, Diane, Jeremy, any final thoughts before I turn it over to Eric? Can I ask you, uh, ask Tom one question, something that I've just been, I was puzzling about it particularly this morning in talking or, arguing with the State Department. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about Henry Kissinger as manager, as the Secretary of State, because we're emphasizing so much in our conversation about the White House. And, you know, here comes, you know, Henry, he's somebody who is not one of us. I mean, I was struck in John Lewis Gaddis's biography of Kennan, you know, hearing about how Kennan was in all the debutante parties. That's what you did in the State Department. Here is Kissinger, he's disdainful, he's done these things. How is he in dealing with the State Department, not the top echelon, but everybody else he has to deal with? Good question. And I'm honestly, I'm, I'm tempted to say that Kissinger never had a great, great reputation as a manager. Um, he used Al Haig in the National Security Council. And in a sense, he usually used others to do the management. Um, it seems in many respects he had a, he did have a loyal group within the State Department. He also had sections of the State Department that resisted him, uh, the Africa Bureau, uh, parts of the Latin America, others who, who did not buy into his type of foreign policy. 
but he seems to have conducted at least relations with other parts of the State Department fairly, fairly well, obviously with some big um, gaps in there where he was quite tough about what he saw as their excessive moralizing on some issues like Latin America and like on, in the question of Africa. But I, I, I think on that one, I probably uh, should punt and, and ask on the management issue. I, don't, I did not uh, feel like I explored that as extensively to give you a good answer. Thank you. Thanks very much. With apologies to those viewers and listeners who I could not call on, and there were a number, uh, let me turn it over to Eric Arneson to conclude, to bring us to a conclusion. Thank you to Tom, Barbara, Diane, Jeremy, and Christian, uh, as well as those of you posing questions from the audience. And as Christian said, apologies to those of you with questions that we couldn't get to. Uh, I will invite you to join us this coming Monday, September 14th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. That's just four days from now for another webinar, this one with Frederick Lagavall on his new book, JFK, Coming of Age in the American Century, 1917-1956. We hope to see you then. Till then, take care and stay safe. And thank you to our panel. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Congratulations. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you.